world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. How are you doing there? Welcome to the David McWilliams podcast, the podcast that every week tries to make economics comprehensible, a little bit less jargony, and hopefully much more relevant. Now this week, because John and I have separately spent time in Africa in the last 10 days, we're going to talk about Africa. But not just about Africa, we're going to talk about the influence of China on Africa, what the Chinese are doing, is there a historical template for what they've been doing? And what is the future of China in Africa? It's a phenomenal, phenomenal continent. Just give you one statistic before we start. In the year 2085, four out of 10 people in the world will be African. So that shows you how important the continent, which has been much neglected over the years, is going to be. And that's where we're at. Before we begin, I want to just mention that this episode is brought to you thanks to our Patreon supporters. And to help support the content, and perhaps more importantly, to unlock exclusive comment and scenes and footage and episodes, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. As always, I'm joined by my old mate, John. How are you, man? Very good. Very good indeed. Yeah. How was your African trip? Well, I tell you, it was really interesting. Every year I do some work with a South African bank and I go down and I chat to them about economics, global economics, and I usually give a talk about the state of the world. And I've always been a huge fan of Johannesburg. I know everybody says yeah. Joburg is dangerous and you don't go down there and, and it is all those things, but it's, there's something extraordinarily vibrant about this massive city into which so many hundreds of thousands of people are coming every month, new migrants coming from all over Africa. And there's, a, there's an energy there which is sort of, it is dangerous, it's a little bit edgy, actually quite edgy, but what yeah. it has is a dynamism in music, in food, in art, in the conversation. So I love going down there and I learned a hell of a lot about Africa while I was down there the last couple of days, which I'm gonna share with everybody. But what about you, you were up in Morocco. Yeah, I, I've never been to, to South Africa. I'd love to go, actually. That, that's certainly on the bucket list. I was in Morocco. I love North Africa. Spent a bit of time in Tunisia. Spent quite a bit of time in Egypt. Had the honeymoon in Egypt, actually. Did you? Uh, and I loved North Africa, but I, I hadn't been to Morocco. And Morocco, I found fascinating. I thought it was a really cool place. Loads going on. We actually ended up, uh, talking about music, we ended up in Essaouira at the Ganawa Music Festival, which is one of the biggest African music festivals. And I think everybody over the age of 15 from Morocco and Mali and all of North Africa descended on Essaouira. The place was jammed. It was great crack. Yeah. Absolute great crack. The thing is, we're going to talk about Morocco because, again, Morocco was involved in this Chinese game, not as much as other countries, but but I think the country next door, as you were saying earlier, Algeria is involved. We'll talk about yeah. that. Do you know, it's a really interesting thing. I was in Marrakesh a couple of years ago. and It's a great city, isn't it? It is an amazing place. But what I loved about Marrakesh was the economic history of Marrakesh, that Marrakesh was the trading centre of a phenomenally profitable and really degenerate trade between humans and salt. So slaves, oh, yeah. slaves were taken from Timbuktu, which is actually down around the Mali neck of the world, right? Yeah. Brought up to Mar Marrakesh, and they were traded for the most valuable commodity in the world at the time, salt. And that's what made Marrakesh <laughs> this trading place. And we'll talk about that. I mean, we've touched on it before with the Black Irish, the notion of slavery being a commodity. And yeah. you know, when we talk about economics, it's really about life. It's not, and it's about history and it's about all sorts of stuff. But I'm, I'm actually really into getting into the whole African thing with you, especially the, the, the Chinese influence in Africa is really interesting. And it's, I could be wrong here, but it feels like it's going a little bit under the radar. It is going under the radar. Now, I mean, the, the thing is, one of the most important things is that power, economic and sovereign power, is all about projecting your power 
miles away from your own borders. That's what defines a superpower. If you become part of people's lives in another world. Now, what the United States has done, and Britain did in the past as well, was they projected their power through military power. So they basically yeah. sailed their gunboats up the river and said, we're here, we're going to do business. This is now part of our neck of the woods. The Chinese are doing something much more interesting. They call it checkbook diplomacy. So what they're doing is they're buying power and privilege through the medium of loans, which is what the IMF used to do and the World Bank used to do. But as the world, and particularly America, has become less interested in globalization and involving itself in the rest of the world, it's become, it's retreated from the world, actually since the first Bush administration. And Obama did okay. it too. Obama did it too. The Chinese have gone in and replaced the World Bank and the IMF. And this all came to me when I was driving into, from Alvar Tambo Airport, and I was talking to the taxi driver. And we were just chit-chatting in South Africa. I said, what's the story? And the African Nations Cup was on. And Nigeria yeah. were playing South Africa. Yeah, I was watching some of that, actually. Yeah, it was brilliant. We were chatting about it, and Nigeria were playing South Africa. Nigeria won in the last minute, actually, as it turned mm. out. But I said, what's the story in South Africa? And he was like, chatting, chatting, chatting. And we were talking. He said, ah, the problem is there's too many immigrants here. I thought it was really interesting. I said, from where? He said, from Zimbabwe, from Nigeria, from Ghana. You know, we don't, we don't get on well yeah. with these people. So that was one thing that was interesting. Then he dropped me, uh, and I was visiting a friend of mine before I was given the speech, in a place called Hillbrow. Now, Hillbrow, the reason I'm talking to a friend of mine there, he runs a boxing club in Hillbrow. Okay. But Hillbrow is probably the roughest area in central Joburg. It used to be an area in the 70s and the 80s was kind of bohemian and hippie. And even before that, it was quite bohemian. And it's amazing art deco, architecture, etc. But the whites left there after apartheid fell, so in the 90s. Right. So what's, what's amazing, it's a bit like Chernobyl. You know in Chernobyl, people left and then all this extraordinary vegetation and animals came in, if you've ever talked to... By the way, that sound behind me is a tractor because I'm actually sitting just on the village <laughs> square here in Croatia. So if you hear kids roaring, shouting, football being playing, people arguing, lovers having a tiff, and a couple of old tractors, you'll know I'm yeah. sitting in the middle of you're, nowhere. You're surveying your land there, Surve are you? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Anyway, so let me go back. So in Hillbrow, the whites left. In the same way as Chernobyl, when people left, all sorts of other things came in. What happened was the whites yeah. left, people expected the place to go to rack and ruin, but actually what happened is that lots and lots of other people came in. People from Mozambique, people from Zimbabwe, all these immigrants your man was talking about. And again, I asked some of the lads I was talking to, some of the young fellows were boxing. I said, look, you know, what's the difference here? And the coaches and whatever, when I was talking to the boxing, and they were saying, and I expected them to talk about apartheid and Nelson Mandela and black versus white and Afrikaners. And they said, no, no, man, the main difference here in the last five or 10 years is Chinese people. They said the wow. Chinese people have come in and they're running lots of the trading operations in this part of Johannesburg, which in itself is this extraordinary melting pot of people from Mozambique, from Angola, from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from Nigeria, from Ethiopia, from all these places. They all, yeah. It's the Dubai of Southern Africa. They come to buy rip-off stuff, proper rip-off stuff in. Okay, it's a bazaar. Right, yeah. It's like a big bazaar. And that's what I love is the way commerce tends to do its thing. You think you isolate a place and you say nothing's ever going to happen there and then people move in and they chat and they trade and they buy and they sell and suddenly you have a different ecosystem. But his point was what's really different in the last five years is the presence of Chinese traders and they are down there right in the most dangerous part of Joburg buying and selling, trading with the locals, trading with the immigrants and facilitating commerce. And I just thought... Let's talk about China in the context of Africa on the basis of that, because something deep is going on and it's going on on the street and the Chinese are on the street and nobody else is. And I think that's what the basis of this podcast is going to be. Brilliant. I, I think that's fascinating because I think that there's a, there's a lot of Chinese influence in Africa and I've read a lot recently and I'm just curious about what's the game? What's, the, what's their play in, in Africa? Okay, here's the game. In 2000, China lent zero dollars to Africa. Yeah. 
In 2018, the Chinese will have lent $700 billion to African countries. Billion. That's the game. $700 billion. So To what end? So let's go back, right? So the whole thing, okay. the whole thing is about lending money to the Africans in order to buy access to commodities because Africa is commodity rich and ultimately to be close to and influential in the country or the continent where four out of 10 human beings will live in 80 years time. So again, the Chinese view is always much longer than our view. And it struck me that a really interesting place to start this conversation is the first time I was ever really aware I saw Africa on television and I was probably with you was in 1974 when we were very young mm -hmm. yeah. and Muhammad Ali was with boxing your dad. with my dad. Do you remember that? And my dad yeah. rented a colour TV for the night <laughs> <laughs> and gave it. It, I gave it back the next fucking day. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> To, to Eddie Totterdale and Dunleary, I was like, man! <laughs> Totterdale's. <laughs> it's the truth. So rented was, by the hour. <laughs> rented by the hour. Do you remember people used to rent coloured TV? It was a Ferguson TV made in Sheffield or somewhere in the north of England. It's the last thing was ever made in the north of England. We rented, right? Probably, yeah. And it was the first time, and I was thinking of this when I was in Africa because of the boxing club, and I was thinking, well, the first time I ever heard about Africa or saw Africa was the rumble in the jungle. The rumble in the jungle, the fight between Muhammad Ali yeah. and George Foreman on the night before Halloween in 1974. All these memories are very important because Halloween as a kid is the big thing. And I've always thought to myself, this was one of the, the great moments in sporting history. It was probably the biggest upset in sporting history. But it struck me as why were they in Zaire? Why were the two biggest boxers in America who should have been yeah. in, in Caesar's Palace or in Madison Square Garden yeah, boxing yeah, yeah. in Zaire. So let's go back to that. Let's talk about debt to the prism of that fantastic boxing match. And then let's look at the impact. Well, hang on a sec, Mark. What, what has that got to do with China? Okay, now I'll tell you. Bear with me. The reason the boxing match, the fight, happened in Zaire is because Zaire had lots and lots of money. Mobutu. Mobutu was the dictator of Zaire. Now, why at the time did he have lots and lots of money and where did the money come from? This is the question. Mm. Because Don yeah. King, do you remember Don King with the hair? I do, the man with the big hair. The big hair, right? Don King's first fight ever as a promoter was the Rumble in the Jungle. Big, big, big okay. promoter. Okay. And then he went on to be Mike Tyson's promoter and we know all that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question is, where did the money come from in Zaire to pay the boxers, to bring all the international media in, to build all the hotels, to have this one momentous, massive sporting occasion. Sorry, to, to, did you say to build hotels for this? They built hotels, they built airports, they built massive highways from the airport. Specifically for the, the rumble in the jungle? For the rumble in the jungle. Now, why is this? This is what I want to explain, is the link between politics and economics and finance and credit and ultimately what happens in countries around the world. Because yeah, people yeah. think that globalization is new. It's not, it's been going on all the time. It's just in different guise. So let's go back. The Rumble in the Jungle is in 1974, October. October 1973 is the Yom Kippur War between Israel and Syria and Egypt. Syria and Egypt invade the Israelis unexpectedly in 73. The first two days of the war, the Israelis are on the back foot completely. They lose the Golan Heights, they lose Sinai. They're trying to mobilize. It looks as if Israel is going to be conquered. The Americans, who were always Israel's backers, step in and give the Israelis huge backing in terms of military hardware and promises that we will back you no matter what. Yeah. The Israelis end up winning that war after three or four days. They counterattack and they win. Arabs, particularly the OPEC Arabs, it's Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and of course Syria is, is in OPEC, Iraq and the United Arab Emirates get really pissed off with the Americans because they backed the enemy and they put in place the first embargo ever on oil prices. So they stop selling oil to the West as a punishment for the West for supporting the Israelis in this war. What happens then, and you'll remember, John, when we were kids, there were queues outside petrol stations 
And people used to go to bed. Yeah, and there was huge, there was huge blackouts and stuff. So we all had candles in our pockets. Exactly. And why is this? Because all most of Irish electricity is generated through oil-fired generators. Mm. So what happened was two things. One is the price of oil goes up. Two is oil becomes scarce in the West. And then three, and this is the important thing, is money because the price of oil went up from $22 a barrel to 48 So it doubled overnight in 1973. That causes a massive transfer of cash from the West, from America and Europe, to the producers of oil, to the Arabs. So you get this yeah. huge, huge amount of cash goes to the Arabs. The Arabs at the time are sitting in Saudi Arabia. They're thinking there's only so many you know, luxury yachts we can buy in Cannes. There's only so much we can spend at home. We need somebody to spend this new money for us. So they give it to the Western banks, particularly Citibank and the Swiss banks. The Swiss banks and Citibank in America say, don't worry, we'll lend the money out for you. We'll earn interest for you. And ultimately, the money you've got from the West due to the oil embargo is going to actually generate yield for you. Then the banks think, well, where are we going to lend it? Now, the problem is because the oil embargo in the West, we had a recession in 74, straight away. 73, 74, with no oil, the West goes into a recession. Yeah. The banks say, well, we can't lend it to the Europeans and the Americans because they're in a recession. They don't want the, the cash. Let's find somewhere else. And they find the third world, what was called the third world, Africa and Latin America. And huge amounts of this new Arab money, which was originally our money, ends up going to places with huge commodity reserves. Places okay. like Zaire, African countries in general, which, which have huge mineral deposits. And the Africans borrowed on the basis that they would always have the mineral deposits as collateral. So if they defaulted on you, you could take their gold, you could take their uranium, you could take their copper, you could take all that okay, sort of stuff. Right. That was the thing. And of course, they lent to Argentina and the Argentinian pledged wheat and beef because that's what Argentina does. They lent to Brazil, same sort of deal on agriculture. They lent to Mexico, Mexico has oil. So basically what you had was a massive shift in the power struggle in terms of where money went. That right. is why Zaire ends up having loads of money a year later. And that is why the rumble in the jungle was in Zaire, okay? Because Mobutu what said- What do you mean? So they, they got all this money that they should have spread around the, the country, developed the industry and agriculture and stuff, but they spent it on a, on a boxing match. What did Argentina spend it on? The World Cup in 1978. Remember, we'd never heard of Argentina and then suddenly it was Mario Kempes and all these sort of things. Yeah, right? yeah. Mexico, the 1986 World Cup was the tail end of that boom. So they spent all the money. Basically, we were dealing with dictators who are usually middle-aged men with the virility complex, okay? <laughs> okay. And what they want to do is they want to be seen as the big guys. We'll have a football tournament, we'll have the World Cup, we'll have the Olympics, la, 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 right? So the rumble in the jungle is part of that story. And I love this, right? So Ali and Foreman go to Africa for the rumble in the jungle. And the reason they do this is because of huge inflows of cash, allowing Mobutu to pay them a huge amount and also to feel that self-confidence of, I'm a big guy, we're gonna have something yeah. in Africa. And of course, the other issue, which we won't get into now, but we'll get into maybe another one, is there was deep underlying race issues in America. That Muhammad Ali had converted to Islam, had said, I'm an African, I'm not an American, I'm an African, not an African American, I'm an African man who happens to be in America by virtue of slavery, and I'm going home to my people, and my people are Africans, and there was this big pan-African thing going on amongst black Americans, particularly after the Vietnam War. You, li you like this, the Marvin Gaye, What's Going On album. Oh yeah, it's a classic album, brilliant. 72, Marvin Gaye's brother comes back from Vietnam, having fought for white America, and ends up still been discriminated against in America. Yeah. They write this album, yeah. what's going on? So if you think about what was going on at the time was sports stars, music stars, black sports stars and music stars were saying, hold on a second, we're getting screwed again. And Muhammad Ali- Did Foreman feel the same? Foreman didn't feel as strongly about it, but Ali was the much bigger personality. Foreman was younger and maybe not as political as Ali, but Ali and King, organized this to basically say to white America, you know what? Africa is rising. 
And the African okay. Rising story was all about a lot of it, the money coming into Africa for the first time in ages. These are newly independent African countries. They want to be on the map. Now, the fight is a classic. Ali's dressing room was like a morgue. It was like the Last Supper. They thought that with his pride, he would take one of the world's worst beatings ever, and he wouldn't give up. The most expensive fight in the history of boxing is on its way. Foreman was the quickest, the heaviest puncher, and he was much younger, which in boxing makes a huge difference, because he's got to be quick. One kid, no damage. That one did. Two wild white hands taken on the side of the head of Muhammad Ali. There's a real strong right hand just underneath the heart. And Muhammad Ali is taking the punishment now. But Ali said, there's one thing we know. Foreman had never gone more than four rounds with anyone in professional boxing. As if he looked into himself and said, all right, this is the moment. This is what you've been waiting for. These are my people. This is what I'm here for. But then Ali figured something out with Angelo Dundee, his manager, that the ropes in Zaire were elasticated and that if you lie back on elastic ropes, the power of the punch coming in will be dissipated through you and onto the ropes and out. So you'll be able to take more punches. Again and again, Ali intends to stay on the ropes, which is very surprising. So Ali starts round one, round two, round three. He doesn't lay a glove on Foreman. He just sits there on the ropes. He gets hammered, 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 hammered. The body punch is absolutely ripping. And then you see in the fourth round, Ali starts whispering to Foreman, says, that all you got, brother? And basically what happens, you see, slowly but surely, Foreman starts to tire and Ali starts to get stronger. And then in the seventh round, maybe eighth. Ali, a sneaky right hand. Another sneaky right hand. This time he works over the shoulder of And that is the great story of the Rumble in the Jungle. So, at the end, Ali described this extraordinary performance as how to rope the dope. That basically, okay. roping the dope was his tactic. The dope was foreman. The rope was his massive invention in the idea. And this is how Ali won. But you're thinking, how do we get back to China? Go on, yeah, that's what I'm waiting for. That basically what happens is the end user of a loan is always where the media look at. Oh my God, they borrowed this much money, or look how much money, or the Chinese have lent 700 billion to the Africans. What I'm much more interested in is where it all starts. So this all started at the Yom Kippur War. So the Yom Kippur follow War- Follow the money. Exactly, this is where I'm with you. So let's follow the money. We start with a war, everybody's thinking about geopolitics, Middle East, yada yada. I'm thinking, hold on, where is the money going? the money ends up going into Don King's pocket. <laughs> That's the interesting thing, right? Now, fast forward to now, and you see, okay, at the time, it was Arab money being recycled by Western banks into third world countries. Now, it's Chinese money being recycled by Chinese companies and Chinese state banks into Africa. But it's exactly the same thing. So back in the past, it was the Yom Kippur War was where the money came from. The money came from the West, goes to the Arabs. Where is the Chinese money coming from? It's the Chinese trade surplus with America. Back to Mr. Trump. The Chinese yeah. trade surplus with America generates all this cash for China. The Chinese then have a choice. What do we do? Do we spend the money? Which is what most democratic countries would do. Why? Because democracy is a four-year game. So every four years, you've got to get re-elected. So you spend the money now, you create a little boom, you fight the election, say, look at us, we've just created a little boom, vote us in again. Chinese don't need to do that shit because it's a dictatorship. So they say, aha, yeah. we've got this money, what are we going to do? We're going to deploy it for long-term gain. And this is exactly what they've done. So, so are you saying that they're a new colonial power then? They are, but colonialism demands people on the ground in terms of 
actual, I'm going to take over your government and I'm going to rip off you, like the Brits did and the Americans did and the French yeah. did in Africa. Chinese are playing a much more interesting game. I've always felt, and every time I go to China, there's no desire in China to conquer the world. Like the Brits had a desire to conquer the world. Or the Spanish or the Portuguese or the French. They think in a different way. It's like, how do we buy long-term influence with a short-term gain, which is American money, from the trade surplus? They say, okay. okay, they say, okay. And what they do then is they lend to countries that need money. And they build infrastructure in countries that need money. And they go into Africa. And I'll give you a statistic, okay? The biggest 50 recipients of Chinese aid in Africa and outside of Africa, but let's talk about Africa, have on average 17% of their GDP is now owed to China. Wow. It's a huge... 17%? Yeah. And of course, the Chinese are masking. Nobody, nobody sees this because normally when country A lends to country B, it goes through the IMF or something called the Paris Club, okay, which is a balance sheet of debtors. The Chinese are not doing this. So for example, we know that China has lent huge amounts of money to Venezuela, to Iran and Zimbabwe in the last 10 years. And they don't come up on any accounts anywhere. So the Chinese are disguising this, but what they're buying is they're buying influence. In return, what the African countries are getting is they're getting infrastructure. Yeah. But the collateral which underpins the loan is commodities because China is a commodity poor country. It doesn't have its own commodities in anything like the amount of commodities it needs. Oil, zinc, or copper, all these things that China needs. So what they're doing is they're actually buying a pledge on future commodity supply by doing deals with Congo, by doing these yeah. with Niger, by doing these with Sorry, South Africa. Can, can I just ask you then, so the source of China's money is their trade surplus with the US. Is that it's correct? American money, yeah. The Americans, yeah, the, okay. the Americans are too dumb to see what's going on. But this is what Trump is banging on about, though. He's banging on about the, the US trade deficit with, with China. Absolutely. And he's banging on about the trade deficit with China because he believes that his people, the largely disenfranchised whites, I was kind of ambiguous about whether he was a racist until the other day when he's actually telling congresswomen yeah. to go back to the country they came from, even though they're American. Yeah, I saw just that. Just because they're slightly that. brown. I mean, weird stuff, yeah. right? But let's go back to Trump. So Trump sees the problem in the microscopic, which is how do I turn this into an electoral strategy where I can win? What we're trying to do is see the problem not as in microscopic, but in macroeconomic terms. So follow the money. So every time an American buys a Chinese good, American money goes to China. The Chinese then have a choice, what do we spend it on? Do we spend it at home to generate a mini boom to win an election? Or do we have a long-term strategic play? The Chinese don't have any elections in reality. They have elections within the Communist Party. So they don't have this constraint that democracies have, which is how do we win elections? So they can say, do you know what? We'll use this money not for 10 years, not for 20 years, but for a 50 or 60 year play. And the 50 yeah. or 60 year play is we know that four out of 10 humans will be African in 2085. We know we need commodities. We know they need money. So let's play the game. Let's lend them $700 billion in a very short period. Now, there's two things going on here, John. One is if the Chinese are right, they buy enormous influence. And there's a really interesting caveat I'll tell you about in a second here. The other thing is, if economic cycles are right, the Chinese could be defaulted on wholesale by the Africans when commodity prices fall. If there's a recession in the West, commodity yeah. prices fall dramatically, the Africans can't pay, and the Africans, or the Chinese, sorry, will end up in the same position as the West was when the whole of the third world defaulted on the West in the 1980s. And then what's the upshot of that? Well, the upshot of that is that the third world or emerging markets or the developing world, whatever you want to call them now, goes into this horrible, as Irish people understand, boom-bust cycle, where you use other people's money, you feel rich about yourself for a while, and then ultimately the other people call the money in and you don't have the foreign reserves to pay it and you end up in debt. 
But the Chinese are saying... Okay. So my understanding is that when countries like Mozambique defaulted on their Chinese loan, China basically said to them, well, we now own your, your roads and your infrastructure. That's exactly the case. So basically the Chinese will end up owning the infrastructure of Africa. And that is their long-term play. Which is crucial for all trade and commerce. Yeah, but that's looking at it from a very Western Chinese are mendacious and manipulative and oh my good God. The other way to look at it is if you're an African, okay. if you're an African, you're saying, I don't care where the money comes from. These dudes want to do a deal with us. The IMF haven't been doing a deal with us. The World Bank haven't been doing a deal with us. You know, we didn't get debt relief actually until Bono and Geldof helped enormously with the debt relief to the third world countries. They dropped the debt yeah. campaign. They were the ones driving it, not the IMF or the World Bank, in fairness. But the Africans are saying, look, we've growing populations. We need infrastructure. We need money. We need investment. Ultimately, if China is the coming power, well, we should be in bed with them and not with the Europeans and the Americans. So look from the African perspective, it looks okay. And from the Chinese perspective then, in order to create new markets for themselves. Exactly. These new markets need infrastructure in order to set up manufacturing sites and be able to move goods around. They need all that stuff. Also, don't forget the Chinese need to sell their, their, their stuff. They need to sell all yeah, their yeah, yeah. consumer goods. And Africa is a massive market and it's growing. But here's a beautiful thing and a really weird thing, that the Chinese are also doing deals now which are based on the following, which is if we build a motorway for you or if we build a train line or if we build an airport, we will send over 10,000 Chinese workers to build it for you. And they'll bring the know-how, they'll bring the teamwork, they'll bring all that. But, and this is the big but, we demand that those Chinese workers get citizenship of your country. And this is a new thing, which is Holy shit. really interesting, right? And that means that the Chinese are thinking if we have our own population in those countries, I'm talking Central Africa, I'm talking West Africa, I'm talking East Africa, and we have Chinese communities who are citizens, politically active, that down the road, again, 20, 30, 40 years, if there needs to be a Chinese voice heard, it will be heard through these guys, which is extraordinary. And they've learned from the Chinese diaspora in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Thailand. There's always been a Chinese diaspora outside of China, a trading yeah. diaspora. And they've always had a link to China that the locals didn't have. And ultimately, so, this is so what they're doing. So this is a kind of a new, this is a new colonialism. It's then. a, I wouldn't call it colonialism because colonialism means you buy the country, but you don't give them anything in return. You just go in and take over the country. What, I, what I've been hearing over the last while in, in the stuff that I've been reading and, and looking at is how Chinese are loaning their money, that it's supposedly no strings attached. So how is Chinese investment in Africa different to, say, China's investment in the West or the West's investment in, in, in Africa? Like the, the West's investment in Africa is always with conditions attached. Well, yeah. I mean, there's two ways... The Western commercial banks stopped investing in Africa, stopped lending to Africa. Investing is kind of a glamorous word for, okay, for, yeah, yeah, for yeah. a heist, okay? Right, let's, let's, it's not. They stopped lending to Africa after all the Africans defaulted in the third world debt crisis. And then all those debts were renegotiated. The, what the Chinese are doing is they are going in for the long term, but with a little kicker in those debts, in those contracts, that if you default, we take your assets, right? But again, if you're in Africa, you've no reason to trust white people. Think of, you know, this idea that there's some... Of course, yeah. Yes. You know, everything we've done to Africans over the years, right? So there's not the same sort of sense of Asians being in some way different or in some way duplicitous or some great plan, if you're poor and you need money, you take it from wherever you can get it. And my sense is that the Chinese come with less conditions to the Africans than the West did. The Africans have been burned by the West financially, emotionally, politically, physically for five or six hundred years. Now they have a new creditor. And ultimately, my sense is that that new creditor probably will end up better behaved in the West. 
And the Chinese, the, <laughs> no, the Chinese, the thing is the Chinese will buy influence in Africa in a way in which we won't. And that's the key. And wh- where is this going to lead then? Okay, well, I happen to think that what's going to happen is the following, that there will be ultimately at some stage a... When, when you lend huge amounts of money to any area, you're then, in a way, the idea is, you know, when you owe the bank 10 quid, it's your problem. When you owe the bank a million quid, it's their problem. So the Chinese run the risk of turning into the lender of last resort for the Africans. The Africans are saying, right. our population is growing. We need money and investment. And in return, we will give you a great place to do business and a great place to sell your products. The Chinese are betting that Africa comes good. And that, I think, is a lovely thing. That's a lovely thing. And it's more than the West is betting on. The West is not betting on that. The West is putting up barriers to immigrants, as we know from North Africa, etc. And it's kind of walked away from Africa. Think about Trump. Yeah, as he famously called them, the shitholes of the world. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. You know, you, you, don't, hear, you don't hear any Chinese person saying that. So... That's the 60-year view. And as always in economics, you have the cycle around the long view. The risk is that there's a commodity crisis, there's a recession, prices of commodities fall dramatically. The Africans can't pay their debts because they have no hard currency. The Chinese then end up owning African infrastructure. And then the Africans turn against the Chinese as they did against the West in the liberation struggles of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, because they see it as neo-colonialism. That's the big game. So China is investing hugely in the infrastructure and therefore laying the groundwork for building the economies of a lot of these African countries, yep. creating new markets and all the rest, creating employment, etc. So, ironically, could China solve Europe's migrant problem? Well, that is a very good question, John. Could China solve Europe's migrant problem? Yes, is the answer. It could, but I suspect that will be the unintended consequence of what China's trying to do. Yeah. What China's trying to do is not bail out the Europeans, because China's quite, quite happy for the Europeans <laughs> to be a little bit anxious about the world, okay? Because, of course. But what China is trying to do is it's looking at the world and saying how we are going to end up in a fight with America in some shape or form in the next 20 or 30 years. The Trump trade war is part of that. It's the beginning of it. It's the commercial expression of a much more interesting geopolitical conflict. What do we do now to buy influence? The last thing we want is Chinese troops on the ground. Like the Americans are happy to go into Iraq. The Americans are happy to threaten the Iranians. The Brits were happy to go into Africa. The French are happy to go into Africa. The Chinese are saying, that ain't going to happen to us. So how do we buy influence in this part of the world? What we do is rather than have gunboat diplomacy, we have checkbook diplomacy. We give them money and in return, we structure their economy in our likeness. So we benefit. And whether that's in trade or whether that's in infrastructure or whether it's giving Chinese people passports to countries like Mozambique and Angola, what it is, is it's amplifying the Chinese voice around the world. And this is really important. This is all about soft power. So hard power is about you go into a country and you kick lumps out of them. And you say, it's kind of Russian power, right? The Russians love a bit of hard power, right? We go in, we kick lumps out of you. We force you to do things that we want you to do by brute force. That's one approach. The Chinese are into soft power which is we get inside your heads, we change your disposition towards us, and we ultimately get you to do what we want in a much softer, much less brutal way, which is we end up having you in our pockets. And that's what the Chinese are doing. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, before we let you go, I want to give you a sneak preview of some premium content which you can access via Patreon. When China strikes deals, infrastructure deals in sub-Saharan Africa, and as we're seeing now, those terms of those deals are not met by the recipient. So the country is unable to pay, right? the terms of the loan. And is this happening quite a lot? So so we do have one case, I think it was Mozambique, where the government failed to pay back 
the terms of the loan agreement to the Chinese. And in fact, now the Chinese are looking and saying, well, uh, this is ours to own. So the claim then falls on the Chinese government to actually own the infrastructure and run it, which is a very, I think that for me is a far more interesting and potentially dangerous, right, way in which to do um, FDI and think about trade relations. If you enjoyed that, you can hear the full episode and much more by joining us on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. See ya.